lost deep in the pages of your Bible are the books that are unmentioned, unheard of, and unread. They are the forgotten books of the Bible. All right, welcome to Your Church Friends Podcast. I am Chris. I'm your the... So our kids started school yesterday. They did. Was that just yesterday? That was just yesterday. That's such a busy week. <laughs> <laughs> you felt like it's already been like three weeks of them in school? Yeah, I don't know. Just yeah. days bleeding into nights, bleeding into days. And yeah, day two. Day two. Yeah, yesterday was pretty hectic for us. Um, day one, all the parents want to drop their kids off and pick them up. You know, it's like a special thing nowadays. I remember when I was little, my mom would just like, here, go find your class and like just drop me off. And then I had to figure out how to get home. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it was just really busy there. And like uh, at the kids school where they go to, my kids, they had uh, like a big old, those ground signs that said, happy first day. And parents were taking pictures of their kids in front of it. So when I went to go look for Reed, it was just like a cluster of people and and because if you didn't take a picture, it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, obviously. So uh, I saw on Instagram, your kids obviously went to school. Yeah, mine kids did. Mine didn't. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't know what happened to yours. <laughs> uh, but also, Reed went from the kindergarten area to first grade. In the, the kindergarten, they would all come up and they would line up and there was their own little place. And I would just wait for them to come out, call them over. This one, they're all filtering first through third grade out of this tunnel Mm -hmm. and i'm like is that his class and then i don't know his teacher yet like i know her and i seen her but i was so used to seeing the kindergarten teacher that that's the face i'm looking for so i'm like is that her is that her i was like no she has a nose ring this lady doesn't have a nose ring so just confusing with a lot of people and a lot of traffic but the kids had fun yeah this was uh casey's first year back since like covid happened so i was all zoom school and then we've been doing homeschooling so, and then she went from elementary school into middle school. Mm. So it's just like, everything's new for her. Yeah, it's big life change. I remember her going in and I remember her going in. She told me that this is what happened. She went in and she had to get the schedule printed out or whatever to tell her what was going on. And it was just, everybody go to the quad. They wouldn't let Delilah go in and all that. And when she was telling us how the day went, she was like, yeah, all that took so long. I, I pretty much missed most of my first period. She's like, but it was math. So it was a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they let, actually, this was the cool part. They let us walk the kids to their classroom. And uh, last year, I had COVID when the kids started school. So I was at home dying. And Justine did all that stuff. So I, I, it was all new to me. Like, I was like, wait, what? You could go in? And then plus, we spent three years of like, no, don't come near me. Stay as far away as possible. And the schools in California with all the restrictions to actually go in and meet the teacher that way. and. Even walk, like I got to walk Reed to his desk and have him sit down. It was just a really cool experience, especially coming out of that like post pandemic. The before times. Yeah, right. (laughs) The times before times. But yeah, it was a cool day for them. Uh, They were, they were excited about it. All right. Forgotten book. Philemon. Oh, is that how you say it? What are you saying? So growing up. Philemon. I used to say Philemon and because I thought he was a Jamaican in the Bible. I thought you were going to say 150 second Pokemon. No. <laughs> Philemon, go. Out of all the things that I look up pronunciation, I didn't look up Philemon because I'm like, yeah, no, that's what that is. Mm-hmm. No, I, I really, for a big chunk of my life, I think I was actually in my 20s, called it Philemon. Mm-hmm. And then I heard Chuck Swindoll do a message on the book and he said Philemon. I was like, dude, Chuck's getting old. Like, he's just making up books that aren't even in the Bible anymore. And as he started reading the story, I was like, wait, that's Philemon. Oh, no. I've been saying it wrong for so long. I feel like this is at least the second time that you've told that Chuck taught you the pronunciation of somebody in the Bible. (laughs) Good old Chuck teaching me how to read a Bible. Uh, But yeah, we're looking at Philemon. And Philemon is a pretty interesting book. So the questions we have, and hopefully we'll get through all of them with enough time, is uh, when and where did Paul write the letter to Philemon? How does the Bible tackle slavery? Who is Onesimus? Who is Philemon? What is reconciliation? And how does the letter of Philemon show us the gospel? Uh, The breakdown can be verse 1 through 3 is his greeting. 4 to 7, he gives a thanksgiving. 
uh, 8 through 22 is appeals on behalf of Onesimus, and then 23 to 25 is a conclusion. So that is the questions. That is the breakdown. Um, it is his shortest book in the Bible, though, or Paul's letters. Yeah, and I like how it's the shortest one, and you're like, let's ask more questions of this thing. <laughs> this thing that takes up less than a page in your Bible, depending on if you got that fine print. Like, yeah. Let's ask like 18 questions. I could have had more. I could have had like six more. Uh, it's only 335 words in the Greek for everyone who's been keeping track of all the words. In been, Greek? Yeah, in Greek we've been doing. Uh, and it's at the end of all of Paul's letters that he wrote. Which on that point, an interesting thing that I never really paid attention to, or maybe I learned it and forgotten it. But with in the Old Testament, when you're looking at the prophets laid out, that they're arranged in order of like longest to shortest. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the letters. Is that once you yep. get beyond the Gospels, that's why you have Romans is such a big book. And then you've got the church letters are like, again, it's all in order from like biggest to smallest. So this is where Philemon is right at the end of that. Yeah, because it's not like uh, Romans wasn't the first letter he wrote. Right. Yeah. But something in my mind, I never paid attention yeah. to like, oh, they're getting shorter as you go along. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I just either. realized like, oh, it's a lot less pages to turn before you get to Revelation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what was this first, yeah. second, third John, it's stuck to Jude. Like, I don't, I'm trying to get to. Just trying to get to that last book. Yeah. So I know what's going to happen at the end. Uh, when I was preparing for this, I, I heard someone say that, that uh, it's at the end because they arrange it from shortest or longest to shortest. There you go. There you go. The more you know. The more you know. So. This book is also interesting because it's written to a particular person, Philemon, and not a community, uh, but it was a, a public written letter dealing with a particular issue. So if we look at Philemon verse 1, it says, Paul, a prisoner in Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to, and then yada, 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 and the names of people, and then to the church that meets at your home. So it was like, it was addressed to Philemon, but this letter was actually going to be read to everyone else. So it was a personal letter, but also a letter that was there for... Yeah, a, gr a group of people, right? Yeah. But when you're looking at the church that meets at your house, it's kind of interesting when you look at tradition with some of this stuff, or even just the ways that letters got written back then. So you have to Philemon, fellow worker, and that goes to Aphia, our sister, that because she's linked right after, a lot of times people think, oh, that's his wife. Mm-hmm. So you think that like, okay, husband and wife. And then I even read that Archippus, our fellow soldier, has been thought of to be their son. Yeah. So if you've got a uh, father, mother, and son, and then the church that meets at their house, it's uh, we don't know how big of a group, but it's at least within the family. Some of it's within the family. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And And if you're looking at, as we go through the book, the issue that he's approaching, it would make sense that it was with him but it also affected the people around him so like it wasn't just gonna affect philemon and onesimus together it was gonna affect everyone around them so and with, within this the church that meets at the house this is still the time people are going from house to house mm -hmm. meeting there is that the people that are meeting together are the people that largely live together they're part of that same community it's not like us around here where we'll travel for however many miles, right, to get to this church because, oh, well, we like their ministry, this, there, this, that, that, whatever. It's just like so much more fellowship and closely knit. It was the church community. This is just who you live with and how things go on. So when you're talking about this going on with Onesimus, who is a person who lived in that community, it would be affecting because as we get into it, Onesimus coming back into this situation it would kind of be the thing of, hey, everybody get on the same page. Yeah, the ramifications went deeper than just Philemon. It, it also, when you were talking about that, made me think like if there's an issue within the church body, you can just go to another church. Mm -hmm. Like that's the way we look at it. Like, well, I didn't like the way this guy's preaching. I didn't like the style of that worship or this or that person rubbed me the wrong way. I'm just going to go find somewhere else. And uh, like you're saying, back then the churches were so small and together that it was family that... Um, you really didn't have that. If there was an issue, it was like, we've got to address the issue and we've got to, we've got to look at it. So each issue did affect everyone else. Um, one of the things I found interesting is that uh, like this letter is closely associated with uh, Colossians. Mm -hmm. So like when we were talking about like, it just seems like every book gets paired up with another book. Uh, this one, we see it has uh, Colossians tied in with it. Which is kind of interesting because like everything getting debated and especially with all the letters if you go back far enough i remember just when i was growing up everything was written by paul yeah like all of these letters written by paul hebrews is written by paul and all the stuff and even if in the scholarly realm it was being debated the general consensus was no it was, it was paul when you get to philemon 
it's very much like no this is paul even in some of the studying that i was doing they were saying like it's too short to even put it into the advanced computers that we have now that can analyze all the different wording and the whatever to cross reference like it's too short to do that way to know no this is him based off of the data but just based off of everything else that's written in it you're like no this is a pauline letter but colossians is one of the books that comes under, eh, did Paul really write this thing? Yeah. So it's interesting that because of the closeness, Colossians gets more of a, no, this should be in the Bible, and it was written by Paul because of the validity of Philemon being written by Paul. Mm -hmm. I mean, you even having, was it Colossians 4, 7, and 8, it says, uh, Tychicus will tell you the news about me. He's a dear, faithful brother and minister, and this and that. And then Ephesians has the same thing. So Ephesians... Philemon and Colossians all kind of tied in together. Uh, he writes, Take a kiss, the dear brother and the faithful servant. The Lord will tell you everything so that you know what's going on with me while I'm here. Um, and uh, so what I, I read was that um, Paul sent all these letters together. Like they were all going in the same general direction. So like he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, while Onesimus is going back, take a kiss, take the Colossian letter. And then while you're on the way, take the letter to Ephesians as well. So, uh, just that tie-in in Colossians and Ephesians, similar in the voice and sound, so all going in the same direction. They had our home dude deliver it. Uh, a lot of the same people are mentioned in both Colossians and Philemon. So you have uh, Philemon has Archippus, uh, Onesimus, Mark, Demas, and Luke, and then there's this other guy, and I'm not going to try. Uh, then Colossians also has Onesimus, Mark, Luke, Demas, and our buddy Archippus. So... Uh, a lot of the tie-ins and similarities there. Um, but to me, the summation of Philemon, just as we get going with like the first question, uh, that this short letter challenges us to, to let the gospel reshape our approach to relationships. Uh, we witness divisive, dehumanizing behavior, and we should challenge it. If we are in the position of power, we should use that power in the service of love, restoration, and equality. And if we are on the underside of power, we should still love generously and embrace our status as equals before Christ. Uh, the world we live in is broken in so many ways uh, with social and economic things driving us apart. But here, the love of Christ is what brings us all together. And with that point, I think that we might it might be beneficial for us to say the big thing that we haven't said yet is that the book is about slavery. Yeah. But not... Slavery, and we'll get into this point, but when we're looking at those things that you were saying, you know, that are being healed by the love of Christ, but you've got these different differences and social issues and everything, is that we have Onesimus was a slave that ran away from Philemon. So Paul is writing to Philemon. Mm -hmm. That's the base of the story. So yeah. just, I feel like some of the things that we've said, even that I was saying earlier, I was like, if you know what this book is, it probably makes sense. Or if you listen to the episode that I've read it, then yeah, you'd kind of know what's going on. But if you didn't do that... That's what unlocks the keys. To yeah, that's much what really saying. helps it out together. So question one is, when and where did Paul write the letter of Philemon? Uh, so that's an easy one to answer as far as the where. That's probably the easiest part. And that was from prison. Mm -hmm. So we have Philemon verse one, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend, and all the other people. Verse nine, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love it is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Christ. And then verse 13, I would have liked to keep him here with me uh, so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. Verse 23, Epaparus, my fellow worker or my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you greetings as well. So Paul refers to himself being in chains for preaching the gospel, um, showing that he's physically in, in prison. Uh, he highlights the situation at the start and then repeats it three more times. And I think he's just really trying to get uh, some sympathy from Philemon just to remind him like, hey, while you're out there doing this, I am here in prison before he makes his request to him in verse 17. But yeah, that, that one to me was the easiest part to address was because Paul says it four times. I'm in prison. I'm in prison. I'm in prison. I'm in prison. But just like anything else, debatable. Um, some of the stuff that I was coming through when you're looking at like the date and where it was written and stuff. So if it was uh, Rome prison, that thing going on, then it would have been in the beginning of the 60s. Is that the date that you mm -hmm. were coming to around there? But when you look at 
how you're saying where this letter was being sent to and where they would have been around, then you're looking at would Onesimus as a slave have gone like the thousand or so miles or yeah, more than a thousand miles to come to Rome? Or would he have gone to the much closer areas of Ephesus and Colossae? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then when you're trying to beg, all right, so if this guy escapes and he's going to join Paul with where Paul's at, would he have really traveled all of that distance? And how would he have traveled that distance that fast versus going to one of these uh, closer locations? You know what I'm trying, what I'm trying to, Did you come across any of this when you were studying? Yeah, so if, you, if it was Rome, you have it composed in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. So like you said, uh, if it was uh, Ephesians, then it was 54 to 57 AD. And then if, if it was uh, Caesarea, it was 58 through 59 AD. So... Which either either one you're looking at, he wrote it somewhere between 54 to 61 AD. But yeah, I saw that it was all three. The case for it not being Rome is like, why would he? Why would Onesimus go so far? Mm -hmm. But because I think it was like Rome from Colossae was uh, a thousand miles, about a thousand miles. Mm -hmm. um, Caesarea was about 500, and I believe Ephesians was about a hundred miles away. So yeah, why would he go? those far and all of these are dependent on what time frame paul was in prison so in acts 28 we could see that paul he wrote uh, uh that he was in prison in rome and then you have later in, in caesarea that he was mentions where he was in prison i think that's also an acts mm -hmm. uh but then uh ephesians isn't actually mentioned in the bible that he was in prison in ephesians uh and then i read somewhere that someone said that uh if i was a runaway slave I would actually try to get as far away from my owner as possible. So yeah. it, though I believe the where is more questionable. Uh, I, I also saw that uh, this letter is part of the um, Paul's prison letters. I didn't even know about this until I actually studied for this book, that the prison letters are Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And each of them starts off Ephesians 3.1, uh, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1.7, uh, is it right for me to feel this way about you uh, since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains uh, or defending the gospel of Christ? And then Colossians 4, 3 says, And pray for us, too, that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mysteries of Christ for which I am in prison. So uh, that these are the four letters that all get sent out together. And I found this, and I thought it was interesting. Richard Malik suggested that the situation uh, with Philemon was the reason behind all three of the other letters. So it was why Paul was writing Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians as well. Interesting. I'll have to go back and read those from that point of view and see like what it unlocks. Yeah, huh. I, I just found it as an interesting point, whether I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense or not. Like I'd have to do the same. But I really thought as for giving out content of like when, where, and why, mm -hmm. uh, that I thought that was an interesting thing. And if you go back and even look at it, right, in Ephesians, he does address like slave and master in there. And then even some of the verbiage is pretty much the same in some of the other books. When we're looking at him being in prison, though, one of the craziest things, this is an aside, but you look at the book of Philippians, and that whole book is just about joy. Yeah. And then you see all these letters how you're reading off and okay he's in prison but the way that he talks about it, like i'm a prisoner of jesus like mm -hmm. i'm not looking at my situation like this he's like i'm only here because i'm obeying jesus like the circumstance just is what it is yeah he never says i'm a prisoner of rome i'm a prisoner of caesar i'm a prisoner because of the jewish community it's i'm a prisoner of christ or i'm a prisoner for the gospel yeah it's important details but when you look at even his mind frame for being a prisoner in verse 22 of Philemon, do we call it Philemon 1 or just Philemon 22? Because it's just one chapter. You know, it's weird when I put my notes, I put one and then the verse next to it just so I don't confuse myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if we're ever saying really large numbers, there's not that many chapters. It's just it's the just verse. One, yeah. So Philemon 22 um, he says, in the meantime, prepare a guest room for me because I hope that through your prayers, I will be restored to you. So in Paul's mind, he's just like, I got things to do. I'm still bringing the gospel around. So yeah, keep praying and get ready because I want to come see you. And Paul does that a lot through his letters. So he's saying, hey, Lord willing, I'm coming to you. And that's even where they were trying to find the dating and the placements mm -hmm. is so many times throughout 
Paul's missionary journeys, he changes his mind or he wants to go a place and the Holy Spirit's like, no, nah, you're not going to that place. And so when you're saying like, well, was he here? Was he here? Was he here? And what's the time frame? We can nail it down somewhat, but yeah, I'm, I'm not as smart as these scholars that we read. So when I see there's a few different possibilities, I can say, I think that it was probably Rome in the 60s. Like that's what makes the most sense based on everything that I read. But yeah, if I were going to lean into one, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go with Rome in the 60s. Yeah. That's the one people agree with the most. Uh, but what I did find interesting going back on that prisoner for Christ thing um, is that it was almost like Paul recognized his ministry didn't stop because he was in prison. Mm-hmm. It was like he just he still was in there preaching the gospel. He was still uh, if he wasn't preaching to the prisoners next to him, he was writing these letters. Yep. These letters that uh, changed the shape of the church they went to and then the church that it was shared with. But 2,000 almost years later, us. Like mm-hmm. We read these letters. So his, his ministry didn't stop. His, his message of the gospel kept going. Yeah, it's great. And when you look at prison there, um, he was on house arrest, basically, mm-hmm. you know, for, for a lot of this, which means that, you know, he had somewhat freedom, but he was chained up to some Roman guards. So basically, he was just ministering and evangelizing to them all the time. And so much of through that, like even going up to, you know, the different levels of uh, Roman society and stuff, everybody was hearing the gospel through, yeah, I'm in prison. And you would think, oh, you can't do much. You're locked up. (laughs) He's like, no. Mm -hmm. And especially you look at him being uh, having the gift of tongues to be able to speak in different language and do like, yeah, he was. He was a tool in God's hands to just no matter where you put him and no matter where he's around, the gospel was getting put out there. Yeah, I read this in a commentary, and I thought it was pretty cool. It said, uh, in Ephesians, Paul implies that his imprisonment provides an example for trusting God in everything. In Philippians, Paul contends that his imprisonment has served to advance the gospel and encourages other believers to share the gospel without fear. In Colossians, Paul sees his imprisonment as a way of fulfilling the work of God uh, has set before him. In Philemon, with Onesimus becoming a follower of Christ while he was in prison, it is apparent that Paul found a way to make converts for Christ even while in prison. So Paul teaches the Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon to believe that God transcends difficult circumstances, gives life over death, paves the way for reconciliation, and strengthens believers through Christ's presence. And I just really thought that was super cool when we're tying these books together or at least saying like these were all written in his time in prison that Paul didn't stop yeah my circumstance got worse or I am in prison but the message of God and he never he never gave into the fact that what he was doing wasn't for Jesus right it was for God for his purpose and that's so important is all the perspective and I think that so much of Christian life is to get the right perspective and mm-hmm. how do you get the right perspective? The renewing of your mind, right? You get into scripture, by the power of the spirit coming in and having that happen, getting to know Jesus and dedicating your life and through obedience and you're having that, your perspective shifts. And more and more so, whereas you'd have Paul say, hey, follow my example as I follow Christ. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ultimately, Christ, uh, he was definitely the suffering servant who came as an atonement for our sins, but he was also the absolute model for what life should be and teacher for what life should be. So feel like so much of this is for our next episode. So did we answer this question? (laughs) I I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's get into question two. How does the Bible tackle slavery head on? Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Head on, but not really. Yeah. Uh, So why why are we looking at this? And you explained it earlier uh, that Onesimus was Philemon's slave. But the bigger issue was that Onesimus was a runaway slave. uh, And... uh, once he became a believer uh, through meeting Paul, uh, Paul was like, hey, you got to go back to your master. Uh, this is what the Roman law says. And this was risky for Onesimus because Philemon, as his slave owner, had the right to punish him or even execute his runaway slave. Right. And when you're looking at he had the right to do that, that right would be at the minimum brand him on the forehead with an F for f- fugitive. Wow. Yeah. Like at the minimum, mm-hmm. you get branded. That way, if you run away again or whatever, everyone, everyone knows. knows. They could even do that if they suspected that you were going to run away. So under suspicion that you might go, like they could brand your head. And then if you're a runaway slave, like poof, you get caught with that. That's no good. On the other side of things, crucifixion. So it's just like the easy thing is to get branded on your forehead. 
the worst one that many slaves did hit was to be crucified, which was the worst form of death that they could come up with. Yeah, which is really what I like about the Bible. Like we talked about it last week, uh, the, the hard question of why is there evil? Well, what does the Bible do? It doesn't shy away from addressing the issue. Uh, so then we're looking at this concept of slavery and what does the Bible do? Yeah, it doesn't shy away from it. But I also think uh, that there is a lens that we need to take off before we really start looking at the Bible. Um, and that is we have to take off our modern idea of what slavery is because our modern idea of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just our modern yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Because everything back then was different and the Bible was written to those people, their culture for them to understand everything that was going on. So uh, like slavery back then was uh, the practice of one person owning another as property or a person owning uh, another one so that he could pay off his debt or even establishing uh, somewhat of a credit for themselves so that they could move up in society. Uh, the most common term for slave in the Hebrew and Greek refers to both a slave and servant. And then the, a frequent term for slave in Hebrew is derived from the word to work or to serve. I, th I thought this was cool. I, I found this. It said the Greek usage outside of the Bible is different. It's more of a negative and derogatory association. So uh, slavery is found throughout the Bible from the Old Testament to the New. Uh, so there's no getting around it. Uh, there's no single description, though, that actually fits slavery in its various forms in the ancient world. So you couldn't look at it from like, this is what slavery is from the uh, Greco-Roman to uh, what was happening in the Old Testament and in between. Yeah, I've got this from Father Lawrence Farley and the Prison Epistles uh, book. And he's talking about slavery in the ancient world. He says, The slave, said Aristotle, is a living tool, and the tool a lifeless slave. You just want to get a perspective. It's just like, cool, you're just a tool. You get the work done, you're just living. And it goes on, That is, a slave was a thing and not a person. He or she had no legal rights whatsoever and was popularly thought to be inferior to a real person in every way, physically, mentally, and morally. It was held that slaves had their innate inferiority hardwired into them that certain men were destined to be slaves and servants of others. Slaves being cross-examined for legal matters were routinely tortured to ensure honesty. They could not marry, they could be bought and sold like any other object, and could be branded in the face if their masters suspected they were planning escape. Runaway slaves, when apprehended, could be executed in the most brutal way when then imagined by crucifixion. So kind of what we already mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, but yeah, there was privileged slaves. You know, some of them served in different places there were slave and master relationships that were really good they were even to the point of you know in scripture when it talks about i paul and my bond servant right right so the idea of a bond servant was i've been set free but i'm choosing to remain a slave here that was a thing in the culture mm -hmm. right and as you were saying it was kind of a form of credit is that you could choose to go into slavery but Again, there's the whole spectrum. You could choose to go into slavery to be able to pay for whatever, you know, make your way up and, and have that. But other people were born into slavery mm -hmm. and you were property, like it was a proper slave. So yeah, it wasn't all the way that we might think about it here in America. Or again, that's my perspective. And whenever I think of slavery, it's just like I very much have on the forefront of my mind African American slavery. Yeah, yeah, that's what we think of, and I think that's uh, that's what we associated with, the North Atlantic slave trade mm -hmm. and uh, the enslavement of African Americans and the Native Americans. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where our brain will initially go with that word. Um, and then we also associate it with racism, right, because that's what a lot of America, that's what it was a lot about. So, um, But in the Old Testament, it's interesting because slavery, it was just part of the human experience. Yeah, slavery goes back to the beginning of everything like slavery has been around for as long as and in every culture and it's been different forms like you were just saying here like it could be on the positive side somewhat of reddit and building that in um but then you look at even here in america you go back to native american tribes it's just like one came over i beat you you're all slaves now <laughs> like, yeah. you know what i mean and it's just like it's just been part of a I almost have been part of American culture. It's been part of world history is slavery. And that was another way someone became a slave is that if we went and conquered your land, you were now our servants. Go back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians, everything we've been right. talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, it, 
what I do like, though, is that the there's regulations for slavery for the Israelites. So the Bible doesn't mm-hmm. leave this um, unchecked. Uh, so there are rules on how to treat uh, slaves in the Bible. Uh, the slaves were allowed to observe the Sabbath. There were specific rules on how to treat them, uh, and a slave could be released in the year of Jubilee. So that mm-hmm. was another thing is that it wasn't about you kept them forever. Uh, they had the freedom to be released. Which that year of Jubilee, every 50 years. Yeah. Right? So it's seven sevens, and on the 50th year was it supposed to be the year of Jubilee, which all debts got reset and all of that. So, you know, depending on when you entered into slavery, they're in an average lifespan. So we've been talking about like even the the debt, right? Mm-hmm. Someone going in because I had to pay off a debt or someone choosing to raise their credit. Uh, but the Bible does not approve of somewhat of the slavery we now put on our modern eyes and look at. Uh, so in Exodus 21, 6, it says, anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. And then in Deuteronomy 24, 7, if someone is caught kidnapping a fellow Israelite and treating or selling them as a slave, the kidnapper must die. You must purge the evil from among you. Right. And then that's followed up in New Testament, 1 Timothy 1, 10. Well, I guess I could go to the beginning of the list. I don't want to read the whole list. Basically, it's a list of the people who aren't going to um, inherit the kingdom. And yeah, it's the bad list. Yeah, it's the bad list. And it lists off slave traders, which mm-hmm. more specifically, if you look into that, enslavers or somewhat along the kidnappers put into slavery. So I think that that very much goes more with maybe the American thought of yeah. of slavery. It's like, yeah, you went over there and you just took people and put them into slavery. Yeah, so like, yeah, the Bible is against it. You you had a couple Old Testament ones, New I, Testament. It's... Go to the end of the book, Revelations uh, 18, 9 through 13. It says, when the king of the earth uh, who had committed adultery with her, so it's talking about Babylon here, and shared her luxury, uh, sees the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to the great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, you were, your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over you because no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stone, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet clothes, every sort of uh, cistern, wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Uh, cargoes of cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, of flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. So the woe to Babylon because they did this. Like this is the destruction of Babylon because of all these things um, in that Old Testament reference. So again, I don't believe the Bible ever condones what we understand as slavery. In fact, it does have harsh words against it, saying that it's, it's not something that's approved. In uh, Jeremiah 34, 16, when we go back to that year of Jubilee, it's talking about like the freedom that you know a slave would get, but mm-hmm. it said, but you have now turned around and profaned my name. Each of you has taken back the male and female slaves you had set free to go where they wished. You have forced them to become your slaves again. So one of the reasons why Israel fell into Babylon, they profaned God's name. How did they profane his name? They took back and made slaves of people that were given their freedom. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the the harshness of like... Yeah, when you have God saying, purge the evil from a movie, it's just like, a purge is, that's a harsh, that's a complete, yeah. Yeah, and so then we look at the New Testament. You you mentioned it, like the, some of the wording has been used of... uh, a servant as being like a thing of God, right? So we are servants of God in there. So it, it kind of changes its wording and usage of like, I am a slave for Christ. Paul mentions himself being that. But the attitude doesn't really change. Uh, Jesus uses it as like a, a true mark of a disciple. So he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers and Gentiles lorded over them and their high office officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for ransom. So I I think we're hitting the nail pretty good to say that biblically, um, and I could read from 1 Corinthians, I could read from Ephesians, I could read over and over again. And I think the Ephesian one is important where it talks about the master and the slave and the treatment 
that Paul says like, hey, if you're a slave, you know, serve your master as if you're serving God uh, and the master. Don't mistreat your slaves. Like, don't do that stuff. Um, because I really think what Paul is getting at is that he's urging all Christians, whether you're a slave or a free person, uh, that, that we are to identify ourselves in our status with Christ. And Which the slave in Christ finds true freedom. Right. And the master in Christ finds, <laughs> I was going to say enslavement, but you know, servitude to mm-hmm. Christ and to others, that things are made equal. Right. And that's where we see with um, Onesimus and Philemon to where Paul is urging is to really, hey, I'm sending him back, not as a slave, but as your brother in Christ. And that that's the relationship that's being restored there. And that that's really the Christian teaching when it comes down to it. And I know people looking at, well, why doesn't the Bible just say, get rid of slavery? And again, going back to that time, on the least end of things, and we were talking about it before, but in Rome, I saw that it was at the least 25% of people were slaves. But the most common thing that came about was about 80%. Yeah, I saw Rome. like 85 to 90. Yeah, we're, we're slaves. Like it was literally what everything was built on. And if you actually uh, took the amount of people that were around that time, that was like 60 million people. Yeah. So when you're looking at there in any of the surrounding areas, Pergamum and like all these places, again, it was just how things functioned. And when you're looking at the approach of the Bible wasn't to take a political outside move to just like yeah let's go smash down this thing of slavery and whatever it was no let's take this and reach people with the gospel and transform people that even in the midst of this form of economy people are loving and treating others correctly Mm -hmm. because you know what i mean in that case it's just like hey if i'm going to work (laughs) and i'm being treated the way that i should by my master and i'm treating him right and doing the work and you know all the stuff it's just like could things be better? Yeah. But even under that, again, you remember that under Roman rule, there wasn't really freedom unless you were a Roman citizen, which Paul had, but many people didn't. And it's like, unless you had that, you were a second class citizen anyways, whether yeah. you were like, quote unquote, free or not. I heard this from uh, our good friend, Father Stephen D. Young. Okay. Yeah. I, I really like some of the stuff he says. I like um, a lot of the stuff he yeah. said. <laughs> uh, but he said this, Paul could care less about whether if people thought slavery was evil or not. What he cares about was how enslaved people were treated and how they lived their lives as Christians while they were enslaved and their masters finding salvation. That's literally what I just said, Chris. I know, but he just said it like so (laughs) Yeah, no, that was one sentence. Yeah, yeah, done. It was like in your face of like, Paul, Paul didn't care. What he cared about was how someone was treated and about the gospel getting spread. And again, him not caring... He lived in that time with that going on. We bring in from our modern mindset so many things. It's just like, how could you not care because slavery is this, that, and the other thing? It's just like, well, yeah, he would care about those things. That's why in the other letters he wrote about those things, right? But yeah. Yeah. I like that. So there's a, a Pliny the Younger. He was a Roman lawyer and a, a senator, and he wrote like a lot of letters. It's a big part of how we know what Roman culture was and civilization. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in one letter, he wrote to, about a master who was murdered by his slave while bathing uh, because the master had mistreated his slaves. So, like, he would warn them, like, don't mistreat your slaves because there's a lot of them and not a lot of you. Right. Um, and then he also wrote about the benefits of giving slaves their freedom because they would end up partnering up with their previous masters. And so it was almost like they built, like, these corporations or chains and, mm-hmm. like, they worked well together. Uh, and even as it goes on further with uh, writings after the New Testament, we have um, First Clement. I'm pulling this out for a specific reason. It says, uh, we know that many among ourselves have delivered themselves to the bondage uh, that they may, might ransom others. Many have sold themselves to slavery and receiving the price paid for themselves have fed others. And I bring that one up because uh, Clement was saying like a lot of uh, a lot. We know a lot of believers who are actually going into slavery to provide for others to provide for others or yeah that gives a perspective right help there help get someone out of slavery yeah you know so um yes in the grand scheme of it especially what america went through slavery is bad yeah it was evil that's where you see god saying purge that evil out of you uh but in that culture so understanding what the bible and what we're getting here with philemon 
that is a different scenario to that. It, it's not yeah. the same. And you brought up a point there where you said, as far as them uh, murdering their owners or masters, however you want to say it, and because there was a lot more. And I found through some of my studies this really interesting perspective on the book of Philemon when it comes to, on the surface, it looks like it's this letter that's written about this runaway slave. But when you look at the fact that it was very much against Roman law, and especially if you have Paul, one who's harboring a runaway slave, which like that just makes him guilty, but then two, naming this slave and sending him back, and it's just like, you're fully incriminating this guy. And just all the way around, it seems like, would Paul have really done that, given that this is literally written down and, and what's going on? And this other perspective that I came across that I find interesting, interesting enough to share anyways, that's something to consider and chew on, is that if this was written in the 60s, the fall of Jerusalem, destruction of the temples in the 70s, right? That's 10 years out. Paul would have been aware of this thing happening. You've got the zealots, you've got the different stuff, and all of these political and social just pressures that have been building. And when you have Paul writing this letter, he couldn't have really discussed openly the politics or referring to like military events and stuff like that because he would have been pegged as a revolutionary and not a theologian. But really, there's a whole thing to get into when you look at there's only been a couple other people in recorded history before the time that this would have been written called Onesimus. And you get into these mm -hmm. different things. And basically, this would have been a bit of a coded letter to go out and say, guys, don't take up arms. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. That it would have been a that isn't the way about it. And when you have... um because of the Onesimus from before and everything that happened as far as someone was killed and going back and, you know, revenge taking all this stuff. And he was basically saying, that's not the way to move forward in this, hmm. is go about it peaceably. And that's where you get the instructions. Hey, receive him as a brother, do the thing and don't go, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it just was more of a coded letter to, hey, there's some occurrences going on. That's not the way we're handling things. I can't tell you it in a different way, but pay attention to the words that I'm saying, basically. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That makes question number three really difficult. Who is Onesimus? <laughs> yeah, right? And that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Most scholarship and everything is, no, it was Onesimus, it was Philemon, and they were, they were people. But there was something about reading that that I go, I could see that because there are other places in scripture, you know, you reference or going back to Revelation, right? Hey, here's the number of the beast. Yeah. For those of you that understand, figure it out. Yeah. Right? There was definitely coded stuff, and they had to do that because if this got intercepted, they didn't want it to be in plain language. So are you saying there's a Bible code? To those who <laughs> understand. <laughs> All right. Who's, if oh. you take the second letter backwards, yeah. and oh, no, I'm, <laughs> we're not doing that. And they all add up to 33. Uh, who is Onesimus? Uh, his name means useful. So we're doing the baby name game, and his name means useful. Which is interesting. Because Paul tells us that. Well, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting when you're looking at being like a slave. Mm -hmm. And the slave is just like, hey, he's useful. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just an interesting thing there. Yeah. So he, uh, he fled from his master, like we talked about, Philemon. Uh, some suggested he stole something. He maybe committed some kind of uh, offense against Philemon or others. Uh, the reality of the situation is it's uncertain. Yeah, we're we really not told. No idea. Uh, he met Paul while Paul was in prison and became a believer. So 10.11 says that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you. <laughs> Paul being funny there. But now yeah, he's the, useful the play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, both to you and to me. So uh, not only did Paul lead him to Christ from what uh, people have gathered and from what I can see here, he also discipled him. So he helped train him up. And then Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon, uh, more than likely, like I mentioned earlier, with Tychicus. And we saw that in Colossians where it says, uh, he is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that's happening here. So that's what we got from the Bible of who Onesimus is. Yeah, that's basically what we have there. Um, sorry, I was kind of quiet when going through because as you're reading that, I was like, listening, I was like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what my notes say. But then I was scrolling through my notes and I found a quote referring to that previous point that I just made. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can I read it yeah, off? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. 
um, just when it's talking about this uh, other Onesimus that had worked in the court in the Republic of Rome, right? So this is what he was. And so here's what it says about this, oh, this other famous Onesimus that he worked at a court in the Republic of Rome. And it says, he always advised the king to peaceable measures and recommended to him that as his father Philip had to the last of his life to uh, establish the rule. It goes on to say, when he could not dissuade him from war, he at first began to absent himself from various pretenses that he might not be present at the proceedings, which he could not approve. So basically was saying, we can't go to war. And whenever things were happening that would just like force him to try and prove it, he would make himself unavailable for those meetings. And that's what Onesimus was all about. So when you're looking at, hey, here's Onesimus coming into this, and it's like, hey, don't go to war. Don't be present in those things. And it, it goes on. Um, that's just interesting. Yeah. There's, there's more to it. So but, speaking of outside the Bible stuff. Yeah. <laughs> see how I tied that back in? Uh, I The name Onesimus appears in the early church list of three bishops. Oh, um, interesting. In there. Uh, so uh, Onesimus. They must have been helpful. Yeah, they were very helpful. Useful. Yeah, useful. useful there you yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, and Onesimus is identified as the third bishop prior to Polycarp. So wherever Polycarp was at. Uh, this Onesimus was murdered under Emperor Domitian uh, in the year 95 AD. So he was killed there. There's another city where there's an Onesimus identified as a bishop. And then the last one is Ephesus. And some say this is more likely the one out of the three. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, referred to a man called Onesimus as bishop or pastor in Ephesians. He became the bishop at Ephesus after Timothy was martyred by uh, the emperor there. So he became the bishop there, and that's where a lot of people say that that's likely where he went after all this was uh, settled. Uh, but the one thing that I read is that Onesimus was apparently a very common name back in that Roman time. So, Yeah, that's cr it's crazy to me that you said he was the third bishop before Polycarp. Mm -hmm. You said that was in 96 that you... Man, the amount of persecution that the early church went through because Polycarp was a disciple of John, supposedly, that he was a disciple under him. And if you look at, so there's John and Polycarp, and by the time that you get to Polycarp, there had already been three bishops in that area. Yeah. And that he was killed is like, man, that's crazy amount of persecution. It really shed some light on that. Uh, and and given at, that in 70, everything just went, yeah, there was the, the revolt that happened, and after that, it was just like, yeah, murder. Yeah. I found this a lot, a lot of this interesting because I've read the book of Philemon so many times and I'm just like, okay, it's a, it's a book about a guy who has to go back to work for this other guy, but not putting in some time in history. Do you then see like, wait, God used these people afterwards mm -hmm. and, and yeah, even the yeah. sacrifice of their lives. And like you said, what they had to go through, uh, that these people, they're just not people in the pages of this book. They were actually, I guess it made it real for me that like this dude, after this whole incident, went out, served God, was a bishop, and then, yeah, was martyred, and then Polycarp, if that if it was that one. If not, then he took over for Timothy after Timothy was martyred. Um, in uh, John Knox, 1935, he's a University of Chicago professor, he proposed this, that Philemon came to be included in the New Testament because of Onesimus's prestige, arguing that, uh, that Onesimus later became the bishop of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. So he said that, like, this is in our Bible, not because of Philemon, but because of Onesimus. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Right uh, on. That's and cool. And then the, um, by the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, and the Lutheran Church all consider Onesimus a saint. So that's who Onesimus is. It's a capital S saint, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Who is Philemon? Well, if, are we doing the, the baby name game still? Yeah. Cool, yeah. Philemon is kind of he who shows kindness, mm -hmm. if you're looking at it that way. But... You could, <laughs> because of the, the wording that's in there, you could kind of call him like Mr. Kiss. Oh, really? <laughs> well, the, the thing that I was reading is like you could call him like Mr. Kiss or the Hugging Hunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like he's the guy that shows, yeah. guy, he'll come up, he'll give you a kiss, he'll give you, he'll give you a hug. And like, yeah, that kind of kindness coming in. Sorry, I just thought that that was really <laughs> <laughs> I just had his main name's affection in Greek, but yeah, Hugging Kissing Guy. Yeah, his name only occurs once in the Bible and it's right there in the beginning, getting addressed to him. Um, as we got it, he was a slave owner. Yeah. Possible husband of Aphia and father of Archippus. Possible. Yeah. Based on it being written that way, but. And he was a friend of Paul and a fellow worker. So 
Philippians 1 has that. The, our friend and fellow worker of Christ, he was a person of great wealth. And people got that because of Paul saying, prepare a guest room for me. And that the church was actually held in his house. And then uh, I really like this. Uh, and it when you mentioned his name, um, it does then tie into this point that he loved God's people and he was an encouragement to Paul. So in verses 4 through 7, it says, uh, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then at the end it says, you have given me great joy and encouragement. Mm -hmm. So I really, I once you kind of said like the hug and kiss, like I, I read somewhere that he was known for his hospitality too. And this is the thing that has always tripped me out with Bible names and why I enjoy getting the, those things going on is because the names always... Well, I can't say always, but the general always coincide with what's actually going on there. So you have this slave that was useless, and we're going to call him useful. Like, he's going to be useful to you, and you have that. But then you have the slave owner, who's the guy that's going, the one who shows kindness. I was like, oh, cool, receive back this slave, and instead of branding him on the forehead or crucifying him, you're the guy that shows kindness. And here's, like, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's like, the names always fit, and... Not that I think that the things are made up, but it's like, do you give a nickname to the story because that's how it goes? And people got nicknames all the time. You have Simon Peter, right? Or you have uh, James and John, the Sons of Thunder, and you get called mm -hmm. that. And so sometimes I just wonder at the names, is is there really that much to a name that you get called that? And that's what actually ends up happening in your life? Or is this just how the thing gets written? It trips me out sometimes. Yeah, I kind of I get what you're saying that like the names they tie in, they mean stuff, they they have that all in there. Uh, one of the things I like looking at this whole dynamic of the three is that so obviously Philemon comes to Christ first, Paul does that first, but Paul knows who Onesimus is mm -hmm. because Onesimus was there during that time, um, and then Paul gets put into prison, whether it's Caesarea, Ephesus, right. or Rome. He was in trouble everywhere he went. Whatever prison Paul was currently located in, in whatever city he was currently located in, um, Onesimus, when he flees, it seems that he went to Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Like he just like he went to him, and there he then receives Christ, and then it brings him all back. You know, he says, "Hey, you got to go back. That's the law." But knowing who Philemon was, I feel like he was able to send Onesimus there, knowing that like this situation is going to get worked out. It almost is like he's buttering him up, but I don't feel yeah, like I was going to say is. that. He kind of does lay it on thick. Thicker than most Paul letters, but I don't think he is. I think he's just reminding him of his character. Like, this is who you are. You're this person. You, you're a worker with me. We've done this together. Um, my favorite verse in the book is, uh, I will pay back whatever he is taking mm -hmm. for you. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. Uh, you know, he just throws that in there like very sly like at the end. Um, which is, I mean, if you're writing a letter and you want to make sure to just like, Hey, just in case, like, think about this fact, I can, you know, I can see the usefulness of, cause you, it's not a face-to-face -face conversation. Right. It's like, was that needed? Who knows? But it's probably better to have it in there. So there's this a reminder of like, Hey, this is who you are, dude. And I know this situation's going to get handled in the right way. Um, and it kind of brings us to question number four of this idea of looking at what is reconciliation? Cause to me. Uh, this is what this book is about mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a good way to look at it is this is reconciliation. Yeah, reconciliation. I don't know why this is always the thing that got put in my mind because it has no bearing on my life because I've never um, actually done this. But <laughs> like when you're reconciling your bank account or your checkbook or whatever and you go through and you're going through on like all of what side of just like, here's what I think that I paid out or what things should be. And then you look at the other number. And like, if those two things don't equal out, you need to reconcile the checking account and make them equal out. And so when you're coming in reconciliation, it's just like if you have these two people or these two parties, as they're coming together, they're not coming together the way that they should. So you need to work through this process of making them come and be united mm -hmm. in oneness together. Again, I Delilah writes all the checks. I've never done anything <laughs> with that. She really likes writing checks. She's kind of old school. But just the image of that to where we know what it is if you're dealing with money and it's just like, whoa, something's out of whack. Like we got to figure this out and make these two things become equal again so they can be united and make things right the way that it should be. Because there's definitely a way that that should be, right? There's a truth that's underlying it. I've taken that really into reconciliation, whether you look like from with God, that God is saying, hey, you're made in my image. I want to welcome you in as a son, as a daughter. 
my son has gone out to forgive you of all things and be an atonement for your sins. This is my stance towards you. But outside of repentance, man's stance is an enemy towards God. So it's just like, how do you bring those two things together to where the relationship is what it should be, right? And as well, the relationship here is that man needs to repent to enter into the loving relationship. And it's the same thing here when you have like, well, you have this runaway slave. So there's all kinds of things happen within the relationship. So how do these two things come and make it to the equal out to what it should be? Yeah. That was a really long and not based off any Greek or Hebrew or anything, but it's my favorite way of looking at it. Yeah. I really like that. Uh, um, the idea of reconciliation, like that should be the function of the church, uh, that we show the example of what reconciliation looks like within the body. Uh, but then we're also reconciling people into the body, right? But I, I read this when doing study for this, and it said, even though Paul does not explicitly ask Philemon to set Onesimus free, Paul was subverting the social norms of his day. He knew that Philemon had certain rights of his, as a slave owner, mm-hmm. uh, but he asked Philemon to set, uh, set those rights aside on the basis of what Christ had done for him. Philemon and Onesimus now had the same standing before Jesus. They were forgiven and loved, and this mindset would leave, lead them to interact as equals. And so when I looked at it, it was like, it should work that way in the church because we should all be able to set aside our rights mm-hmm. and realize that we have an equal standing before God, Yep, that we're all forgiven and loved. And those things should allow us to come together and say like, yeah, let's, let's reconcile. Let's balance the checkbook. So if I've wronged you, where is it? And, and it's forgiveness that yeah, reconciles, yeah. Yeah. I think we had the conversation a while ago through text. It's like, uh, what's forgiveness? Uh, when we were talking about that, and it was like, well, you know, there's got to be in a repentance in order for forgiveness to be like complete. And then we came up with the conclusion that it's uh, repentance plus forgiveness equals reconciliation. Mm-hmm. And and that's really, I like that equation. Yeah, that's what the gospel presents for us. So, uh, question number five, then, and I, I kind of want to go through this one. I I put this there purposefully because I saw something in the book wait before you do that add one other thing on the reconciliation just going off what you said with the rights and what that is is that again going to the culture of all of this Mm -hmm. this book being included with the scriptures and being made known and everything else that slavery kept existing for quite a while after this book was written in the manner of which it was existing when it was written right is that it gives such a testimony for hey, here's this cultural thing, and you have every right if you were to do the thing based on what all the culture and everything else says, but in the church, it happens different. Yeah. And it's such a testimony of, as how you said, the subversion, but just in Christ, here's how we handle things. It's like, you're, yeah, you're in your full right. And even Paul's saying, I could come and give him my position, tell you what to do, but I'm appealing through love, saying this love that you've received and this love that it's all about, yeah, put aside your rights. And it's just a testimony in a really real way, in a really practical sense that this is dealing with economics, it's dealing with pride, it's dealing with rights, it's dealing with all the stuff. And it's just, no, in a really practical manner in life, being in Christ looks entirely different. Yeah. Like, I don't think Onesimus went back and got an F branded on his forehead. Right. Like, I just don't. That would have made him a weird looking bishop. But would have been a testimony. <laughs> would have been a testimony. All right. Anyways, I'm I just want to say, that up like, I really like the book for that yeah. perspective because there's so many things in today's world, especially in America, we're all about our rights and we're all about this. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that comes from that. But if you're a slave to Christ, why are you going to boast about your rights in the world? Yeah. Because being one in Christ, we're equal. Do my rights trump your rights? Or like, what does that all look like? And mm-hmm. yeah, the forgiveness and the reconciliation that's found within Christ. Um, it's freedom. It's yeah. real freedom. You know, you want to, how do you not be a slave? Reconcile. Find that reconciliation in Christ, and that allows you to have that freedom. All right, so tell me your heresy. All right, uh, so the question is, how does the letter of Philemon show us the gospel? So, Onesimus is us. It's a slave to their master who one day decides, I'm going to leave that master. And for whatever reason it is, I'm going to leave that master. I'm going to go out and live my life, my way, my own way. I'm going to do what I want uh, to experience the freedom that I never had. And he goes out and does that. Uh, And then obviously that doesn't go well, right? So it's not working the way he thought it was. It's not going exactly how he thought. Uh, Not knowing what to do next and just floundering around until there is an encounter. And 
the encounter with Jesus that most of us would have, uh, it's Paul in this situation, right? Onesimus meets Paul. Paul leads him to Christ. His changes uh, over the course of time. Obviously, Jesus wants us to have that reconciliation relationship back with the Father. So he intervenes for us, and he tells the Master, "Hey, previously this guy was useless, but now he's useful." Right, and we see that within the Bible that Jesus intervenes for us. And then uh, this is really where I kind of struck this chord, hit me, was verses 18 through 19. Receive him back, and whatever debt, whatever his wrong, I will pay for it. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand, and I will pay it back. And that's what Christ did for us. And that's what Christ goes up to the Father and says, like, hey, he's part of the family, he's in, I paid the debt for this person. Um, and now that that broken relationship is now restored, uh, we go back and it's not going back necessarily as a slave, but we're going back as family. So he'll serve his master faithfully. We'll all serve the master faithfully and loyally, uh, but not because he has to like he did before. He'll serve because the master, uh, he loves the master. And I just thought that analogy is Onesimus is us, um, Philemon's God, Paul is Jesus. And that's the intervening, and that's the gospel. Yeah, I would say not heresy. The book has definitely been interpreted that way by many people, you know, throughout history. I don't know. I mean, definitely as far as the gospel goes in revealing that um, from things that I've studied, I got that message. I don't know if I got the direct, this is this person, this is this person, this is this person, but definitely the message behind it. That's yeah. where I was like, this might be heresy. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean. Because that I, it, I was sitting there and I'm reading the book. I had just read that verse. And I saw earlier where someone said, like, Paul was like Jesus in that moment, right? Going to pay the debt. Mm -hmm. And then I started just looking at the book, and I was like, wait, Onesimus, a slave. We're slave to something. We're mm -hmm. all slave to sin. We're slave to... Um, but what is the whole book of the gospel or the Bible? It's like reconciliation back into the family. So I've got, <laughs> I've got a smile on my face because just like any analogy or allegory, you can break it. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's just it's not made to be broken. It's meant to be used to understand. I was just, like, trying to think. Okay, so Jesus is coming to the Father saying, hey, I could tell you what to do, but I'm appealing to love. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, obviously, you know, don't take it to that. But no, I'm, the way that you worded it, the way that you worded it is just beautiful. And it is such a clear picture. Like, no argument there. When you say, how does the letter show, show us the gospel? I have nothing to add to that, Chris. I mean, if it could show us your war code, I'm assuming it could show us the... The gospel as right, well. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I would fall more on the side of showing the gospel and not necessarily. <laughs> Could be showing both, right? Yeah, so that's all I've got for this book. Um, I, I really do like it. I can't wait to dig into more of the practical stuff when we look at reconciliation in a deeper level, um, when we look at um, the rights and the testimony that this has, and especially like the, what you are bringing up, the setting side of our cultural rights to our heavenly rights, which... Which one lines up more? Which one are we tracking with more? Um, but I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. It's a little book filled with a lot. Yeah. It, Either that or we just like to talk. Probably. This both. has been a long episode. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, going through these books and hopefully whoever is joining with us is really seeing that like these little books, they're the knockout punch it feels like sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, like the long books are the fighter who's like working the body, working the body, working the body, and then finally hits the right spot in the body and the body goes down or it just shuts down because for 14 rounds, you've worked the body. Right. Um, but these little books are just like, here's the knockout. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to hit you hard and it's going to hurt. Yeah. I just, I like that we can study and that we can kind of pull ourselves back into the context and the everything mm -hmm. so that it can deliver that knockout. But I know that still missing out on so much that would really give it that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's where, yeah, study the Bible for your whole life, and it just keeps feeding. It does. The A lot of the stuff we pulled from it today, I had no idea. I read this book, little one-pager book, 25 verses, so many times. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, I just thought it was about a slave and an owner, and that was it, and left it at that. I wouldn't even like, oh, let's preach from Philemon, because that's going to be a good source of like, this and that, you know, to get this story, you could go to other stories in the Bible. It tells the same thing almost. Uh, but here again, like, yeah, just the more you study the Bible, it 
does start to unfold. The more you put yourself into the culture of the Bible, the more you take off the lenses of me reading it today and putting myself as the person who was reading it then. And in taking ourselves out of our modern context and culture to read it in the context of which it was written isn't to say that, hey, we should live like ancient Hebrews or ancient Greeks or any of that stuff, right? Because the purpose that we're trying to get in understanding it from the correct cultural standpoint is to change us into having the heavenly culture, Yeah. right? It's not about like, well, let's understand it so that we can really understand, like, is this how slavery was supposed to be back then or how it should be now? It's just like, no, 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 we're, we're trying to understand it appropriately so that we can understand the truth of the gospel so that we can understand in a correct way and that by the power of the spirit, we can have here on earth a heavenly culture mm-hmm. that's entirely outside of, so. I really like that. Uh, yeah, because we could read this book and like with our today perspective be, so Paul's saying the slavery is okay. He's sending a slave back to become a slave. He's mm-hmm. condoning slavery. So the Bible is evil and wrong uh, because that's now my opinion of it. This could have been a much shorter podcast if you started with that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Here's what the book is. Yeah. All right, done. And, but when we take it out and we understand the culture and the context of it, then you're understanding like this isn't what Paul's saying. This isn't what Paul's doing. It's a lot different. You have to take yourself out of that. And I liked what you just said that uh, this isn't a book about how do the Jews who are Christians now live in a Roman time, or if we go back further, how the Israelites live in the promised land, although it is that for us today, it's not a book that then says, this is how you live in America, or this is how you live in American culture. This is how you have heavenly culture in America. Mm-hmm. This is how you have heavenly culture wherever you live in Canada, Mexico, wherever it is, this is how you have culture there. It's a heavenly culture within where you're at. And that's what it was. The Israelites were like, this is how you're God's people in the land I'm giving you. Yep. The people that were there, they done messed up that land. They they deprived it of everything. That's why they were going in there to take over that land from them because they had ruined it. Um, so all that from 25-page book or 25-chapter book. 25 verses even. Did I say it wrong again? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got to stop talking. It's been too long. All right. I am Chris. I'm your th- We are your church friends. Thanks for listening. Abaka. Nahum. Obadiah. Jude. Philemon. Haggai. Amos.